Good talk. Hot, Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. So a lot of people are pointing a finger at President Biden. Do you think that's fair? Oh, that's why I've been using for the last three days the hashtag Biden's war on all my social media accounts. I mean, this is the, the utter tragedy of the situation, Douglas, that, that young Ukrainians are fighting for their liberty. Children and women are being shelled by the Russians uh, in a war that was utterly, utterly not called for, that wasn't necessary. Uh, Vladimir Putin is a psychotic, murderous KGB thug who took the measure of Biden who saw the absolutely catastrophic surrender of Afghanistan under his watch, saw that when he came into office, Douglas, think of this, the first day in office, uh, President Biden canceled the XL Keystone pipeline of energy into the United States from Canada, killing 40,000 jobs for ideological reasons. At the same time, he lifted the sanctions on Vladimir Putin's Nord Stream pipeline into Europe. As a result, in the space of less than 10 months, Russia became the fourth largest importer of uh, energy into the United States. Putin has us over a barrel. He sees weakness. He sees a feckless administration. He sees the disaster in Afghanistan. And he made his move. I've been asked many, many times over the last three days, what would you say to this administration? What advice would you give? And it's pointless. The cake has been baked. We need Donald Trump back in the White House. We need leadership. I was so hearted as, as, a, as a former British citizen who grew up under Margaret Thatcher's UK to see not only Boris Johnson, but to see Keir Starmer together give that speech in Parliament where they say, we stand by the Ukrainians. We support every effort for them to liberate themselves. That's real leadership. And it is very sad that we have no such leadership of that ilk in the White House today. Real, realistically, what, what do you think your former boss uh, would have done? There have been reports this week, and perhaps you can confirm them or otherwise, of uh, conversations that uh, President Trump, former President Trump, was said to have had with President Putin about exactly this. One report that's, that's been doing the rounds this week was that uh, President Trump told Putin that if uh, he was ever to invade Ukraine during the Trump presidency, uh, he, Trump, uh, would attack Moscow. First of all, is, is that the case? Do you believe that? Let me give you an answer, Douglas, that uh, given your sagacity, you will understand what it means. I can neither confirm or deny the reports of that conversation having happened. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we all know what that means. Um, OK, uh, but, but, but t tell me, I mean, realistically, would you think it was because uh, do you think the reason why Putin didn't uh, take anything for the four years of the Trump presidency was a sort of fear of what Donald Trump might do? It seemed to have acted as a deterrent for other people. Utterly, uh, utterly, utterly. So, so let, let me just illustrate for, for your, your fabulous listeners. You know, when we came in to the administration, we unleashed the American energy sector, which is the only thing that really makes uh, Putin hurt when you're not dependent upon him. In, the, in less than three years, we became a net exporter of energy. In the first time in the history of the American Republic, we exported more energy than we imported to the country. On top of that, we, we took NATO seriously. We said to everybody, no more freeloaders, pull your weight, pay your fair share, including Germany. And then how about this? After four years of Russian collusion, he's Putin's puppet, President Trump is the first president in the history of the United States to order the targeting of more than 200 Russian troops in Syria. Not even Ronald Reagan greenlit the targeting and killing of hundreds of Russians that were destabilizing another region of the world. That was President Trump. Putin was afraid of him. Little Kim in North Korea was afraid. The Mullahs, China, were all afraid of President Trump because he's not an interventionist. Let, let me be very clear. I wasn't an interventionist, nor is President Trump. We didn't invade other countries, but we sent a very clear message. If you threaten our civilization, we will come down on you like the hammers of hell. Remember that state dinner at Mar-a-Lago, where oh, literally over chocolate cake, President Trump leans over and whispers to Xi Jinping, I just want to tell you, um, I just dropped 52 cruise missiles on Bashar al-Assad's regime because they were about to use chemical weapons for a second time against innocent civilians, including women and children. That message wasn't just to Xi Jinping. 
It was for Putin. It was for all dictators. That's why the catastrophe we witnessed today, Douglas, would not have happened if my former boss was still the commander in chief. Well, let's let's come to another issue, which is the whole issue of NATO. Uh, when your former yes. boss was in the White House, he was very often criticized by people as being anti-NATO uh, or in some way uh, undermining the NATO alliance. Of course, what what uh, President Trump was seemed to be doing uh, was what every U.S. president in recent memory has tried to do, which is to make the Europeans pay for their own defense. Uh, yes. to at least meet their commitments, their own spending commitments of at least 2% of GDP uh, on, uh, on, on defense. And of course, uh, uh, President Trump used perhaps particularly uh, um, hard language, shall we say, against them. But it was exactly the same thing as every other American president has tried, to try to persuade the Europeans to spend more. What do you think uh, uh, is the situation that NATO is now in? Uh, you have a wide knowledge of, uh, of not just American politics, but also of European and particularly Eastern and Central European politics. What, what do you think the situation for NATO is today? Well, I, I actually cut my teeth in the 1990s on, on, uh, on, on NATO issues. I was a, a fellow at the NATO Defense College in Rome. So, so, you know, the fact is for 30 years we've been trying to get NATO nations to get serious about this club. Imagine if you're a member of a club, club Douglas, and 60% of, you know, the, the ma annual membership fee is, is 100 quid. Imagine if 60% of the members pay 50 quid a year, and then one of the members is supposed to pick up the slack of their not paying their dues. President Trump said, this is over, this ends now. If you're a friend, if you're a serious ally, act like it. I remember very clearly when uh, Merkel, Chancellor Angela Merkel, came to D.C. for her first summit with the president, her first bilateral, and we were berated, we, we were lectured at about how serious the, the, the German commitment to collective defense was. Well, we pulled out the latest paperwork and said, Madam Chancellor, the president has just signed an incremental increase to the U.S. defense budget, just the increase for this year that is larger than the whole defense budget of the federal state of Germany. You are not a serious NATO ally. We spoke harshly so that NATO would be strong. Now, as a child of those who escaped Hungary in 1956, witnessing again Russian tanks being attacked by Molotov cocktails because civilians are being raped and murdered, I say to NATO, it will be those who have lived under the boot of the Soviets, like the Hungarians, the Poles, and the Baltic states, who must show the rest of the alliance the seriousness of the situation and give an example of their leadership. I am, I am very buoyed by what the British government has done with the deployment of troops to Estonia, now is the time for serious gentlemen to do serious things. And finally, briefly, uh, do you think this is a, a wake up call to NATO and that NATO can actually come into its own again? For 30 years now, since the end of the Cold War, people have said, what's the point of NATO? Is it clear what the point of NATO is now? If this is not the wake-up call, then nothing is the wake-up call, and NATO will wither and die. NATO has been the most successful uh, alliance of the military alliance of the modern age. This is the final test. Tanks are on the streets of a free nation today that has been invaded by an authoritarian regime. If NATO actually represents freedom, and self-determination and the Western alliance of our civilization, they will be measured by how they respond to this war. Good talk. Hot talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio.